democracy who you want to to run your country, be your members of parliament, uh, be your counselors. That's critically important. You know, not everybody around the world has this sacred right to be able to vote. And so we need to cherish it. It's very important to protect it. And I think, you know, for your citizens, that is, that's the crucial thing that you need to, to safeguard. And really only the citizens of the country, they're the ones who can safeguard Zambia's democracy and insist that we want the opportunity to hear discussion, hear debate, you know, participate, meet our candidates, you know, um, do it safely, but participate, you know, see open exchange of discussions and debates in the media, both independent media, private and public media. You know, all those things are just uh, essential. It comes back to freeness, fairness, you know, transparency, and peacefulness. Mm. You know, I think those are just foundational principles of a free election. Mm. Yeah, you, you've talked uh, still on the issue of the Public Order Act. These elections are going to be held, uh, you know, in the new normal, under strict, you know, observance uh, to COVID-19. Um, there is the Public Order Act which, you know, political parties or political players, those that are campaigning, needs to notify the police. And also, with the Minister of Health, we are told that, um, you know, these political parties are supposed to, you know, get clearance if they are to meet or to assemble people. And the numbers have been reduced that you are to meet only 50 people. And as you are meeting 50 people, make sure that, uh, you know, the prevention methods or protocols, COVID-19 preventive protocols are put in place. With the Minister of Health, the Zambia Police, and other stakeholders that are involved in making sure that even as people or political parties are trying to sell their manifesto, are observing the COVID-19 rules and not putting the lives of people at, at, at risk. Uh, what has been your assessment? On the Public Order Act, we know that we have the Zambia Police that are responsible for that. But again, there is a Minister of Health that has been, you know, brought into, into, into play. How would, you, how would you describe the combination of the Zambia Police in enforcing the Public Order Act and the Ministry of Health in making sure that these political parties are adhering to COVID-19 rules? Well, first on the Public Order Act, I think one of the things to emphasize is that when you look at the law, it really requires for notification mm. before you have a gathering. Yes. And basically, if a group uh, wants to gather in a group, they should notify the police in the interest of public order, public safety, so that you know the security forces are aware of an event happening. The challenge has been, um, the way it's been enforced historically o over time in Zambia, uh, and this has happened, of course, over a lot of elections, mm. is that, you know, government gives notice but is never turned down, uh, you know, uh, for uh, under the Public Order Act. Whereas opposition and civil society often give notice, but then uh, they are told, no, you can't go ahead. You've given us notice, but we're not going to give you permission. That's that e unequal standard. And that's the challenge because, mm. um, and then, you know, we work very closely with the Ministry of Health, clearly, you know, who are the champions to defend the lives of Zambian people. And we work so closely with the ministry to save lives during COVID as we also fight HIV, AIDS and tuberculosis, malaria, other diseases here. Um, but again, it, in a campaign season, you have to do this with, with balance. Mm -hmm. It has to be the same standards for all. And... Um, you know, during this crucial period in the run-up to the August 12th vote, you know, people need to be able to have the chance to hear from all sides, and it can't just be imbalanced. Mm. So that's, um, there is the potential when those kind of cross-cutting regulations come together in an unfair, unbalanced way, that's problematic. Mm. Uh, let's talk about um, political violence. Um, the Electoral Commission of Zambia, a body that is charged with the mandate of presiding over the elections, uh, did inform the nation that there are two political parties that are making their work difficult. And we saw the Electoral Commission of Zambia imposing a ban, a 14 days ban, to the ruling Patriotic Front and the opposition United Party for National Development not to be campaigning physically in Lusaka, Namwala, Nakonde and Mpulungo because of the reports of violence that occurred in these uh, four, you know, districts. Um, how do you 
describe the issue of um, violence, the way it has been, you know, political party cadres crashing, even during road shows, you hear that this camp, you know, went to disrupt the, 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 the road show for the other political party, you know, they blocked the road, and so that is why the Electoral Commission of Zambia came up with the decision of banning these, you know, uh, two political parties. In your own assessment, what do you think is causing this political violence? Well, I think that I would just say up front that the Zambian people are uh, largely peaceful people and they want peaceful elections. They want to have a situation where they can campaign and vote and have their votes counted in a peaceful environment. Um, you know, as I talk to people across the country and, you know, as I meet people from different parts of the country or talk on the phone or video conference, you know, people in government, opposition, civil society, the church, businesses, everybody, most everybody, wants a peaceful election. Um, I think, you know, Cotter violence is a major problem. And we look around the world, we, we have to recognize that safeguarding peace within a democracy is critical. Um, I think it's absolutely important that any violence by Cotters uh, must be, they must be brought to book. They must be held to account. And when there's an attack or an intimidation, uh, you know, uh, some of these tragic attacks that have happened recently, it's very important that cotters are, are brought to book. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't have a situation where uh, people are kind of winked at or allowed to go out and uh, conduct violent attacks. There has to be accountability to stop it. I think the Electoral Commission, uh, you know, has made some good efforts in that regard. I think that was an important signal to send to the parties, you know, that we don't want to see Cotter violence. We want to see uh, this stop. And I think uh, as we're now in the last four weeks of the campaign, I think we need to see uh, an adherence to a peaceful conduct of elections. This depends on leadership, depends on leadership of parties. Uh, you know, we just had the peace conference earlier this week that mm -hmm. I attended at Mulungushi Conference Center. And, you know, all the major candidates, all the major parties uh, committed uh, to, um, the, to sign a pledge by all the parties um, of wanting to commit to peace. I think that's an absolutely critical thing. We need the leaders of the parties to enforce that for their members and insist you know, that if you're going to come out to support me, if you're going to be my supporter, you need to be peaceful, you need to advocate for me, be peaceful, and wear masks. You know, you have to be peaceful and healthy at the same time. And mm. I think uh, party leadership needs to insist on that from their followers. Mm. Before we talk about the, the, the peace accord that was signed by, uh, you know, different political parties at Mulungush, of which you attended, um, we have seen and heard uh, the leaders of these political parties. You've talked about leadership, but we've seen and we've heard uh, these uh, you know, leaders of political parties having a message to their followers that um, elections is all about contestations of ideas. Let us sell our, our manifesto. His Excellency President Ed Galungu is on record saying, I have commanded and given a directive to all party members that let us move with the manifesto and convince people based on the manifesto. But the opposite keeps on coming where we hear political cadres crashing from the two, you know, uh, major political party, the ruling and the major uh, opposition political party. Where are we missing it? Where are they missing it? Because words from their leadership, from their leaders, is that let us commit and co let us commit ourselves and let us make sure that we engage in issue-based politics. But when it comes on the reality, on the ground, we see cadres crashing. Where are, where are we missing it? Yeah, I think that you know, leadership demands that you, you insist to your followers, you, you message this consistently, that I want you, you use the bully pulpit, you know, we say, that you use the, the podium to say uh, the microphone. When you have that chance as a candidate you, and uh, one of the senior people in parties, you have to message to your people, be peaceful. Just insist that that's that's a requirement to follow me. If you want to support my vision, my plan for the country, I want you to be peaceful. I don't think you can say that often enough. You have to say that over and over. You have to insist. And when someone 
uh, commits violent acts, you as a candidate need to call uh, for accountability. Even if someone was supporting you, you need to condemn that violence and mm. call that out. I think that's absolutely critical. And I think the public will appreciate that, you know, when people call out uh, violence by their own supporters. I think it shows statesmanship. I think it shows leadership. Mm. You've talked about uh, the event, uh, the signing ceremony of the peace, uh, the peace accord. We saw political parties committing and uh, saying we are going to uh, engage ourselves in issue-based campaigns and we are not go going to engage in political violence. But we saw other political parties refusing to sign, to say we have not been, you know, uh, engaging in political violence. We have not recorded any political violence. We've not fought any political party. So it is up to the political parties that have been fighting to sign the peace accord. Do you see, after that commitment, political violence ending or, you know, reducing in this country? I think that, you know, the signing of the pledge is an important step. It's an important uh, symbol. It's an important commitment on part of the parties who signed, the leaders who signed. I think that's a positive. You know, um, the, the churches, the civil society, uh, many other organizations were there to witness it as uh, friendly observers. Others were there to witness the signing of the peace accord. I think that that's an important step, but you know, words aren't enough. It requires actions. Mm. And those who are critical of the process are, are correct in saying, what matters are the actions. You know, you don't just sign a document, but you have to go tell your supporters, don't do this. Mm. Call them out when they do it. It takes follow-up steps. Mm. It takes a commitment to peace. And I think that's, that's the important thing that we need from political leaders uh, in these last days. And particularly, you know, you look ahead to the uh, election day itself, the 12th, and those days afterwards when the votes are being counted, mm. you know, those hours that are tense, uh, this is a very closely, tightly uh, conducted election, you know. Um, and so it's a hard fought vote. Uh, but we need to have the commitment of party supporters to be peaceful. Mm. And I think, you know, during the campaign period, uh, we need that leadership to say to your supporters, stay peaceful. When you vote on election day, stay peaceful. And in the aftermath of the vote, while it's being counted, stay peaceful. In some ways, that's almost the most critical period looking ahead four weeks from now. Mm. Do you think our political leaders have what it takes in ending political violence? You've mentioned that um, words are not enough. But what matters is also, uh, you know, action and following it up. Do you think they have what it takes to end political violence? If they have, why is it that they've allowed political violence to escalate to these levels? I think it's, you know, in a campaign season, it's very easy to, uh, you're so much into the competition and the fighting and the jousting and the campaigning. Um, you have to simultaneously fight for your vision, fight for your your perspective, but also have that statesmanship to see the greater good for the country, the greater good for Zambia. So you have to do those at the same time. I think, you know, knowing some of the major candidates, you know, I think they are people of, uh, they're good people. And I think that if I would just call on my friends, you know, to be committed to those principles and to insist to your followers that these, this is critical for Zambia. You know, we just celebrated uh, the amazing life of a 97-year-old man, mm. you know, the founding president of Zambia, Dr. Kaunda. He inspired people, he inspires people in this country. You know, when you look at his historic role and how over his 10 decades of life, he was a patriot, you know, fighting for liberation, independence of the country. He was the founding president. He stayed a long time in office, but then he made a very important commitment to the peaceful transfer of power to multi-party democracy. That was one of his greatest legacies. It was amazing. And then he committed himself to peace. You know, one Zambia, one nation. Mm. That is why we remember and venerate, uh, you know, Dr. Kond, uh, the founding president of this wonderful country. And I think he also used that platform to go on to, you know, campaign for social solidarity, to, to fight against poverty, to mm. dignity of all God's children. 
you know, fighting against HIV and AIDS and against stigma. But you come back to that historic role he played of laying, helping lay the foundation for multi-party democracy and his willingness to say, you know, I will see the greater good for the country, you know, even despite that it might not be convenient for me and my short-term interest. And I think, you know, for all the candidates and certainly the major candidates, think about the importance for the whole country. Uh, think about this legacy of peace, the legacy of democracy. Um, this is a sacred trust we have as democracies. And when we look around the world, uh, you know, democracy faces real challenges. Democracy faces real challenges in my own country. We've been through a very tough period, but we have people who commit themselves to the higher ideals and the greater good of the country. And that's what's desperately, desperately needed. So my friendly message to my friends here in Zambia is just remember that sacred trust you have as a largely peaceful democracy and protect that. Uh, you know, strive for that, uh, work for that, because that's the heritage of all Zambia citizens. Mm. Uh, th th there's, uh, there's this belief in Zambia from uh, different stakeholders and civil society organizations that have, uh, you know, concluded to say for violence to continue, looking at how it has continued in Zambia during by-elections, you hear of, uh, you know, political violence. Now in a general election, again, issues of political violence are being reported day in, day out. The civil society organization, some civil society organization and some members of the public have, you know, concluded to say some political leaders do benefit from political violence. Do you agree with that notion? Well, you know, there can be short-term gain and long-term loss. Mm. And I think, you know, it is not, in my view, a winning strategy to pursue violence. Um, I think we need to see that when people get into public life and public service, you get into it for good reasons, to help your country, mm. to make the lives of people better. And when you use or encourage or look the other way uh, for violence, that is a very negative thing for the country, for democracy, and the citizens. I think that having a principled stand that says, I'm against violence. I want to call the country to its highest ideals. I want to call the country to its ideals of democracy, free and fair elections, peace. That, those are the heritage. That's the important rights uh, that people need to see, need to protect. And I think that's political leadership, that's statesmanship. And I, I would just urge, encourage uh, political leaders, candidates to campaign on that premise because that's what's needed for Zambia. Mm. Two major political parties, the ruling party and uh, the main opposition, the UPND, have uh, you know, issued similar statements condemning the police, that the police is not helping matters when it comes to stopping violence by bringing to book perpetrators of violence. The UPND have cried foul that despite uh, reporting these issues or matters to the police, the police seem hesitant to arrest perpetrators of violence. Equally, from the ruling party, the Secretary General of the party is on record uh, saying the police is not helping in arresting perpetrators of violence from the other camp and other you know, members of the PF have also cried foul that the police is not helping in uh, you know, uh, bringing to a stop issues of, of violence by arresting perpetrators of violence. Uh, what, how would you describe the conduct of the police when it comes to dealing with political violence by arresting people that have been named and mentioned? What I would emphasize is, as you said, the very important role that the police have to play. I think it's absolutely critical for uh, peace to prevail that security services play that very important role. It's not my position, and I'm not really in a position to judge, really, about individual cases. I know there are some instances where people have been brought to book, and that's very important. Um, but I think, you know, that uh, that role is critically important over these next days. And again, I would just urge everyone as citizens and public servants in all different ways 
to be especially vigilant as election day approaches and those days afterwards because I think you know the the leadership that's needed at all levels is critical for August 12th 13th 14th 15th that is going to be a crucial period uh, and people need to anticipate that and think about that uh, you know it's for the good of the country and we all need to people need to be calm they need to let the Electoral Commission do its job, count the votes, announce the votes, you know, and be calm and accept the results. I think that's absolutely critical for the country. And we need to anticipate that law enforcement, uh, the people in the Electoral Commission, people who are participating in the democratic system, and political leaders from the, the battling parties mm. uh, need to emphasize the commitment to peace. Because you know you can't you can't put the genie back in the bottle once it mm -hmm. comes out you mm -hmm. know and once uh, violence starts to flare uh, you know we look at look at the tragedies in South Africa right now you mm -hmm. know violence can spread very quickly and you know we don't want to get a situation where cotters get out of control. Mm. Let's talk about um, issues of uh, you know hate speech and um, you know tribalism. Zambia is a country that has got 73 tribes. <laughs> And during these campaigns, the Electoral Commission of Zambia have put it on record that political parties should engage in issue-based campaigns. But again, we've seen some overzealous or excited politicians, you know, um, conducting themselves in hate speech, name-calling, and uh, also, you know, trying to divide the country by looking at regionalism, ethnicity, and, uh, you know, tribal talks. What do you make of this? Well, I think, um, you know, the action by the Electoral Commission just several weeks ago uh, with one candidate, you know, trying to make some very strong statements of censure uh, because of use of hate speech, I think that was very powerful. I think that, you know, it needs to be emphasized that hate speech will not be tolerated. Uh, I think uh, authorities and government, uh, you know, need to do that. Uh, but again, you have to balance you know, hate speech, which incites people to violence, is clearly unacceptable. It needs to be called out. Because if you incite people to violence, you're participating in the violence. Mm. You're equally guilty. Um, but at the same time, people need to be able to have free speech and have debates. You know, you need to, uh, on your station, on other TV radio stations, you know, in newspapers, you know, at gatherings, people need to be able to de debate the issues and say, I'm for this candidate, this is my vision, this is what I think. And you can do that in a respectful way, but it's very important that people be able to have fair comment and criticism. You know, you need to be able to uh, critique, debate, you know, argue, you know, disagree. Uh, but you have to do that as part of free speech, freedom of the press. That's absolutely critical to a democracy, and that is one of the sacred rights of the democratic uh, space. How would you describe the performance of the media in this critical time uh, run up in the run-up to August polls? How has the media performed, both the public and private? I think there's been some very uh, important uh, reporting, uh, hosting of shows. Uh, I've appreciated the work that you all have done, Kelvin, and your station and Thank you. other stations, mm. you know, that have been out there uh, sharing views from different uh, perspectives. You know, letting government have the chance to talk about its perspectives, that's critically important. But letting opposition have the same opportunity. Again, the issue of balance. And providing that marketplace of ideas, you know, where people can come into the marketplace and, and share the different ideas in that discussion and that debate that's critically, critically important. So I think there's some really outstanding examples. I, I think some of the media have tried to do some hard-hitting reporting. You know, you look at some of the reports in newspapers recently, and they've taken on some tough subjects. And, you know, as reporters, uh, I used to be a reporter, uh, you, you don't always get everything right, but you do your best, and you work your best to get the facts as correct as possible. But you have to have that ability to go into uh, tough issues and talk about issues that are important for the country and its democracy. If you don't have that, if you mute uh, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, 
you, you strangle democracy, and we, and we can't have that. Mm. People have, uh, you know, talked about elections not being a one-day, uh, you know, event, and you've, um, you've talked about the, 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 after the ballot has been uh, casted, the counting, and that, that, that is the critical time. Um, let's talk about observers and monitors. So far, people are saying elections are not just going to be conducted on the 12th, but whatever is happening in a build-up, to August 12th, and what is going to happen after August 12th also is, uh, you know, packaged as, uh, you know, a part of elections. How would you, you know, uh, describe the role that, you know, observers uh, should play in this critical time? And so far, what is it that, um, you know, stakeholders should look out for in these, uh, you know, observers and monitors that some are already here and others are still to come? Yeah, I think the role of of citizen monitors is critical to democracy. And I would just salute all the people, all the Zambians who participate in monitoring efforts as local domestic monitors, you know, being out there to to basically watch what's happening with on voting day, observing the polls, promoting transparency, you know, having eyes on on all the polling stations. I think it's a very positive thing for a democracy that you know, the major parties, the two major parties, which, you know, clearly are contesting uh, this presidential election, you know, for, for both of them to have people at all the polling stations, you know, around the country, you know, to watch what's happening, have eyes on. I've been privileged in the other elections that I've been here that I've seen in my previous time here in Zambia to be at polling stations, you know, on election day mm. and watch the counting of the votes as people, the votes are counted, they're announced and people there monitor it. That is so important for the transparency. And I just want to salute the major uh, domestic uh, monitoring, uh, you know, organizations that go out to, as citizens, to observe uh, the polls and the counting of the votes. Mm. Uh, you know, international partners like ourselves, uh, the European Union, the United Nations, you know, SADC, African Union, there's a wide variety of other friends and partners of Zambia that also come as international observers, or those of us at our embassy, for example, mm. will be out observing uh, polling uh, stations on election day as well. Um, you know, we play a complementary role. Uh, but again, this is your country. You know, this is Zambia's election. This is Zambia's democracy. So we're here as supportive partners. We help support some of the institutions that make this possible. We help support domestic monitors. But ultimately, this is your democracy and, and your vote. Mm. Also, the issue of, uh, you know, local mon monitors. Uh, in, <coughs> in, in, in this case, let me talk about the civil society organizations. Um, there is a belief that uh, civil society in this country has been divided. There are those that are championing the agenda of um, the party that is in power. There are those that are championing the agenda of the opposition. Equally, the church, you know, people have argued that the church has been divided in this country. There are some clergy that are supporting the ruling party, and there are some who are you not know, supporting the opposition. And so when it comes to issues of monitoring, they cannot give, you know, they cannot agree there are those that believe in the ruling party, so they'll side with the ruling party. Those that believe with the opposition, they'll side with the opposition. What could be your message to the civil society organization as well as the church as we are building up to August Pauls? I think the role that uh, local monitors play in terms of monitoring the election neutrally and being very uh, rigorous in how you monitor polling stations to look at the context of the election, how campaigning's going on in the run-up to the election, how the votes on election day are cast, how they're counted. You know, all those things are absolutely essential to have credible people who are committed to the process of democracy. Mm. You know, similarly, in, our, in the United States, we had one of the most divisive elections that we have ever had in modern times. But there were literally thousands and thousands and thousands of heroes, heroes of democracy. And it was those poll workers, mm. the people who volunteered to work at the polls, the people who worked as, as monitors that, to watch the counting of the results, people who were citizens active in democracy, who paid attention, who cared, who came out on uh, election day uh, around the country. They're the heroes of democracy. 
these are your heroes of Zambian democracy too. Mm. And I would just say again, an appreciation to everyone who participates in these kind of efforts. It's absolutely critically important for the health of your democracy and securing and keeping, you know, securing these very sacred rights as democratic citizens. Mm. Let's talk about uh, printing of ballot papers. You know, the printing of ballot papers, we are told by the Electoral Commission of Zambia that uh, for councillors, uh, council chairpersons and mayors, they have concluded and the printing of, uh, you know, parliamentary uh, ballot papers ongoing uh, smoothly also with the issue of presidential ballot papers. And as we speak, only two political parties have got representation in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, the rest of 14 of these uh, other political parties have got no uh, representation. Uh, do you see seriousness in some of the political parties that have got no representation? Because the two political parties that have got representation so far have described the process as free and fair. They are content. They are happy. Yeah, I mean, I think when we look at the landscape of the, the political environment here, I think we all recognize it's the two major political parties. There are a couple other important candidates. I won't start naming names, mm, but, mm. Uh, you know, a couple other important candidates do have some prominence. Um, but, you know, having the fact that both of those two major parties, government and opposition, were in Dubai to observe the printing of those ballot papers, I think was a very, very positive sign. I think that can give confidence, uh, help reinforce for Zambian citizens the fact that these two parties that don't get along very well, uh, you know, were there and came to the same conclusion mm. as they've watched the printing of the ballot papers in Dubai. I think that's a real positive. Mm. Um, again, you know, smaller parties um, where you don't have as much resources, you don't have as many supporters, it's very difficult to get to Dubai. It's challenging in the era of COVID to get to Dubai, mm. frankly, now because of the you know, the Delta variant of COVID, which is restricted travel around much of the, of, the, of the continent. So that's been challenging. But I think the fact that both parties have been there has been really good. If only one of the two had been there, I think that would be concerning and people would be very concerned about that. But again, this is a positive they've both been there. Uh, Mr. Young, others um, are scared and they're saying the fact that only two political parties have got representatives in Dubai, uh, we are likely to see an event where these other political parties who did not send representatives start crying foul to say the printing was not free and fair and we suspect that something might have, been, uh, might have happened. Uh, do you agree with them that maybe they have all the rights to, to, to start, you know, crying foul that because we didn't have representatives, then the printing was not, you know, done in a genuine manner? You know, I think the bigger, the bigger issue today is looking ahead to August 12th itself. I think the fact that you have the two main parties, um, you know, here in your system, and you basically have a de facto two-party system right now, as we do in the United States. We have a de facto two-party system. Mm. Um, when you have eyes on from both sides on this particular process, I think that's a positive. I think what people need to keep eyes on is looking ahead to August 12th, 13th, 14th. You know, having eyes on polling stations, having eyes open of voting and, you know, tabulation and, and counting. I think that's just very important that citizens be aware and as I said before, you know, an appreciation for Senate citizen monitors and others who play that absolutely critical role in democracy. And people need to be vigilant. You know, people need to care. And they, they need to insist as citizens that, you know, we care about our democracy. We care about transparency. We care about peace. And we, we safeguard our important freedoms uh, in our democratic rights. Mm. After all has been said and done, I know that there are some issues that you raised on the issue of fairness, the issue of the Public Order Act. Is it guaranteed that um, Zambia will have a free and fair elections based on what has happened and the suggestion to say we, Zambians need to focus their attention on the 12th, 13th, going forward. Is it a guarantee 
with what has been happening so far and the conduct of the Electoral Commission of Zambia so far, you know, kudos are being showered on them from the two major political parties on the printing of ballot papers. Also, the Zambia police, people are still calling them to say with the remaining days, they need to up their game and make sure that they spark confidence in the, the electoral, you know, you know, stakeholders and the citizens. Also from the citizens saying these political parties need to do more. Is it guaranteed that we are likely to have free and fair elections. You know, I think when we look around the world, when we step back and take a big perspective, we look at my country, we look at countries in Europe, we look at countries across Africa, you know, there's no guarantee that an election will be free and fair. There's no guarantee. Mm. You can't have a guarantee. Um, you know, we, I think, had some backsliding in the United States, but the courageous actions of citizens have secured our democratic system and we have institutions that have proven strong to protect and secure our democracy. It's kind of like our house shook, but the foundations held. Mm. I think that, you know, for me as an American, it makes me realize that there isn't a guarantee. You know, this depends on the commitment of citizens. And for your viewers, you know, tonight, you know, people to think this is your democracy. This is your country. This is your heritage. This is what the multi-party democracy that you've had for 30 years, you know, that uh, Dr. Cohn uh, passed over, you mm -hmm. know, when the, uh, the first democratic transition of power took place, you know. Um, this, this depends, people, it depends on your commitment as citizens. Um, and so I think that, you know, we all need to recognize that these important roles that citizens play in a democracy and democratic elections is absolutely crucial. We can't take it for granted. And I think when we look at democratic backsliding around the world, uh, we need to recognize that nothing's guaranteed. It depends on the committed, energetic efforts of public servants, people in private sector, and it, you know, private citizen uh, civil society. And it depends on leaders in all the parties. Mm. So I would come back to the leaders of the parties, the leaders of the PF leaders of UPND, the leaders of other important parties. It depends on your leadership, you know, to make sure that your followers are committed to these principles, committed to peace, committed to fairness, mm. committed to respect for the results for the good of the country. That's absolutely critical. So this next month is, this is a very important time for Zambia's democracy. And, mm. you know, I think what we've been through in the United States shows us you can't take these things for granted. Mm. Uh, Mr. Young, as we are winding down, um, you, in your preamble, you talked about the vaccine, that uh, if Zambians have got an opportunity, they should make sure that they get uh, this uh, you know, vaccine. We are going towards the elections in August, but also we are battling with the third wave of uh, the COVID-19. Uh, how has been your government's uh, commitment and uh, you know, assisting Zambia in making sure that we have the vaccines and uh, essentials to fight the COVID-19? Yeah, just in the last uh, couple of weeks, we've authorized several shipments of new vaccines that are coming. Uh, we've been working with the Ministry of Health on 165,000 doses of the uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine There's an, that comes through COVAX, which is the international uh, alliance uh, umbrella that facilitates the vaccines. Uh, there is another uh, dose of COVAX vaccines that we're supporting that has just also been notified. Uh, I was just seeing it earlier this evening. Um, so the Biden administration, President Biden has committed that we are uh, distributing and pushing out around the world 80 million doses of vaccine right now, mm. and he's committed to 500 million more doses of vaccine that we're working to mobilize for our friends and partners around, in all countries around the world as soon as possible. Mm. And that starts over these next months. Uh, he also at the G7 summit uh, was able to work with other G7 partners, the seven major democratic industrialized countries, uh, to basically collectively mobilize one billion doses of vaccine. Mm. It still is not enough. But I think what is critically important is that people need to be aware that these, these jabs, these vaccines save your life. You know, people get, you know, shots for all kinds of things, mm. you know, different vaccines. These vaccines are safe. 
They'll save your life. You have to have perspective. And sometimes these rumors get started and people start believing superstitious things or, you know, they get misled. And that's very unfortunate because we've all seen that the tragedies that have happened in my embassy, we have lost so many loved ones of our embassy uh, family members, you know, family members of people who work for the embassy. Uh, it's just been a terrible tragedy that people have lost, you know, spouses and parents and siblings and cousins and aunts. And it's just, it's a terrible tragedy. When people get the chance to be vaccinated, please get vaccinated, mm. you know, seek those opportunities. There are more vaccines coming to Zambia all the time. The Ministry of Health, the Permanent Secretary, everyone is working so hard to get those vaccines here. So when you have the chance, please take that chance because uh, it's life-saving. How would you describe the response of Zambians when it comes to getting the job so far? How has been the response? It's uneven. It's mm. unbalanced. <laughs> That's my theme for the night. Right? <laughs> but uh, I think that, you know, we have some uh, friends who are very aware of, uh, you know, how important it is. Mm. Uh, we've been able at our embassy to get vaccines uh, for almost everyone who works at our embassy, you know, our Zambian as well as our American staff. Um, and we, uh, but also there's a greater awareness, I think, during this third wave with the Delta variant, people have realized how contagious it is and how deadly it is. And so there's a greater awareness of people wanting to get the jab. Mm. But, you know, still there, you know, when you drive over here, as we all drive around town and we drive around, you know, you just look around how many people are wearing masks and how many people are wearing masks properly, you know, when they're not vaccinated. And it's just critically important that people, the thing you can do until you get vaccinated is wear the mask, mm. cover your nose and mouth when you're out with people outside your family, mm. you just have to do that. But if you wear your mask, you know, you can keep from getting COVID, it will protect you. And then when you have the vaccine, get it because then that provides an amazing level of protection that prevents you from basically dying from COVID. Mr. Young, let me allow you to give us your concluding remarks. We have to go. Well, thank you very much, Calvin. It's always a pleasure to chat with you. Uh, again, I just want to say the United States and Zambia have an amazing partnership. Mm. And for me as a diplomat, it's my second time serving in your country. It's been a great privilege. Uh, you know, I, uh, I love this country. It feels like my second home. I have so many friends across this country and I'm deeply committed as we all are at the American Embassy to the partnership we have together. Mm. We save lives, we work together, we educate kids, we improve trade, we fight wildlife trafficking, uh, we work on peacekeeping. We do so many things together that makes a difference. And you know, that's uh, something that we have in partnership between uh, Zambians and Americans. Mm. There you have it. This has been the special interview on your channel of choice, Movie Television, and I've been chatting with U.S. Embassy in Zambia, Charged the Affairs, David Young, who have been looking at the state of the nation as we are building up to the August 12th elections, talking about elections and how, you know, political parties have been conducting themselves. You've heard it for yourself. The American government is committed to make sure that Zambians decide in a peaceful manner come August 12th. On behalf of Mavuto Piri, who has been the director and producer of the show, uh, Chris and the guys upstairs, my name is Kelvin Tabola, Chief Focal. Until next time, good night. Thank you, Kevin.
People's Choice on Movie TV. Brought to you with the association of Airtel. Airtel, the smartphone network. People's Choice on Movie TV. Brought to you with the association of Airtel. Airtel, the smartphone network. Contra 